welcome to Nine One Wine, to our second episode ever with our first guest, Tom Rinaldi. Hello. <laughs> if you don't know who Tom Rinaldi is, he's been in Saint Helena and in wine in Napa Valley for, gosh, fifty years, forty-five, or forty-six. Yeah. So a few summers, uh, and he is. <laughs> Uh, quite the winemaker here, um, and now a consulting winemaker for a lot of different brands. And we're excited to talk to Tom and get his take on A, the police log, and B, St. Lena's gone in the last 50 years. Log is a kick in the pants. I, I have been a subscriber for the, to the St. Lena Star for eons, and the one page you definitely want to turn to is the police log, and it tells you what's going on for the last week and uh, from the most humorous to the most kind of head scratching <laughs> would you say that we have like very intense crime here oh it's an amazingly scary town for the crime <laughs> i mean somebody occasionally will take something from safeway and it'll you know it'll come out as burglary at uh, hunt avenue me, uh, uh, bu- uh, business and uh, <laughs> somebody took a you know six pack of beer and they're probably only 17 or 18 years old which I think is a felony isn't it <laughs> and this town is probably a shooting offense oh my god so what are we drinking tonight we are trying our 2013 estate uh, Hewitt vineyard and uh, it's a Rutherford Cabernet. Um, at the time, it is still 100. Well, no, this one has some Petit Verdot in it, a uh, very small amount, maybe 2 or 3%. I was the original winemaker for Hewitt Vineyard, and um, I wanted to make sure that uh, I had my way with this vineyard, and um, the, the company owned it agreed. So um, I left Duckhorn Vineyards just to be able to call it Hewitt Vineyards. John Deere's uh, last family member to run the the company was Bill Hewitt, William A. Hewitt. And um, he always wanted his name on the bottle, but it went to uh, BV for their private reserve. So it ended up being uh, only George Latour's name goes on the bottle. So he had to pass away in the, at the 1998 uh, before our, the, a big company bought it. It was a Shalom Wine Group, which was owned by uh, NASDAQ and by Baron Eric Rothschild of Chateau Lafitte. You come up to a winemaker and you mention that you'd be working for Chateau Lafitte. They get sugar plums dancing in their heads. <laughs> so... Um, it's an opportunity I couldn't pass up, so I wanted to make sure his name got on the label and that we make a brand of it and that we use only the fruit from that vineyard. And so far, so good. It says estate grown, and that means it's 100% from that vineyard and never left the winery once it was made. So it's, it's, a, it's a pride and joy, if you will. Mm. So question, Tom. It also says double plus. What does the double plus mean? Well, the double plus is the highest end uh, of the wines that we make. Well, we being, the, now it is a Diageo, and now it's Treasury. It's been moving around from different hands. But uh, as winemaker, I always had 100% um, artistic freedom, I call it. So I could make the wine as I wish. But we would go by barrel by barrel by barrel and rate each of the barrels from question mark which is not too good and that's probably going to end up in the Rutherford Cabernet to a plus which would be Hewitt grade and every now and then we found a spectacular wine that we call double plus and here it is and here it is so well I I always look at the aroma first uh, first of all color and then the uh, the color is phenomenal I mean it's not it's just bright uh, bright purple red and um, you know, gel. It, it's you can see through it if, if you don't pour too much in your glass. But uh, it, it is bright red. No, 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 no sign of browning or brick color anywhere in this wine. 
take a, a big sniff. And what I say for Rutherford is that you don't get cherries and berries. You'll typically get herbal characteristics. And for me, this one has uh, some cedar. Sometimes I call it florist for, uh, floor, mm -hmm. forest floor. And just a touch of a, a maple kind of characteristic in the in the background. And of course, it was in a barrel for 18 to 20 months, 20 months. And so you'll pick up some of that vanilla and some of the sweetness on the taste too. That These are non-fermentable hexoses that um, are like a little bit of equal or some kind of sweetener, not sugar, but sweetener in, in your uh, espresso or your cappuccino just to kind of round out that, that edginess that can come with a younger wine mm. like this. This wine will live for 20 to 30 years. I'm, I'm convinced of that. The wines I've seen in my youth are still alive and well. So um, I, I've been making wines now that I know no matter how long I live, I'll, they'll outlive me. Wow, that's great. And what kind of treatment on the oak and, um, are you doing with this? Typically what we'll do is we'll ferment the wine in a tank at, mm -hmm. at a relatively cooler temperature until the middle part of the fermentation then we'll allow it to get up to maybe a hundred degrees um, probably closer to 90 degrees hmm. and then uh, then chill it back down again toward 80 and after a period of time we keep tasting the wines once they're finished fermenting and um, at a certain point they just seem to have the roundness and the muscle and uh, the texture that we're aiming for so that's the day we're going to be pressing we're going to drain out every drop we can get from that tank and then we're going to open up the door and start shoveling out the uh, pumice or the leftover skins and um, typically we'll keep those separate from the free run and we'll we'll put all that uh, that that pumice uh, that the skins into the press and give them a squeeze and after about we call it 0.2 bars what the heck is that well a bar is atmosphere so it's very light very light amount of pressing before we call it no longer free run and that's we're going to call it a press fraction and we'll move it to a different tank and we'll decide later on down the road how we put those together and they'll typically get racked after a few days into barrels and we allow the secondary fermentation so-called malolactic fermentation to occur in the barrel and then it's time to remove that wine one more time rinse out the barrel and put them back to bed and um, and, and there they sit typically losing one liter per barrel per month mm. Uh, we call it the angel share. So once a month, we're coming through topping that barrel back up again with its counterparts. And um, we're concentrating, concentrating, because we're not losing wine through the pores. We're losing water and water alcohol mix. And so it's getting more and more concentrated over that year, year and a half, that uh, the year and a half, the almost two years um, that we keep the wine in the barrel. And is your French, French oak, and then you do... How many? This would be 100% French oak okay. in the neighborhood of 60% new. Cool. Nice. Okay. Cool. This was your last year at Hewitt, right? Mm -hmm. 13. It was, I, I left in November of 2014. 14. So okay. I actually made all the decisions for the harvest for the 2014. Cool. Uh, but I wasn't around for the bottling. Of the 13, so mm -hmm. I didn't get my name on it, but for so all what, intents and purposes. But then you went on some other projects. What are a couple of correct. other Well, I'm projects. up in Washington with Ambassador Wines of Washington. Mm -hmm. I've been up there nine years. I get a wonderful reception. It, it's so funny could, to be a Napa Valley winemaker and get open arms. Uh, it, does, it isn't the same in Sonoma County. Uh, it isn't the same up in Oregon. Uh, they'll go, what are you doing here? Isn't Napa, isn't that auto parts? <laughs> so, so um, but it, it's been a wonderful ride. I, I've been up there going on nine years now, 
and um, I, I just have a wonderful feeling for the future of Washington wines. Uh, we're out on Red Mountain in the Tri-Cities uh, on the eastern part of Washington, and we own the vineyard, and we're selling grapes to my old haunt, uh, Duckhorn, to call it Canvas Back, and um, we're, we're a growing brand. I have a couple of tasting rooms in Woodenville, and they're, they're just heading to the moon. It, it's just been a great ride. Interesting thing that they do, and I don't know that I've said this with pretty much anybody, but if you go to Costco up there, you can buy these um, tours or tastings uh, at varying wineries that are all in Woodenville. So people typically come in there and they flash their Costco um, <laughs> enter, you know, ent please enter, you know, and uh, a whole big percentage of them join the club, which is great for our future, nice. because then they'll buy wines on a regular basis and they're big, big fans. So that's a great ride. I don't yeah. trust anyone that doesn't like Costco. <laughs> Good. Fair enough. Fair enough. We're America shops. <laughs> so you can say you've had some experience here in St. Helena. So we're going to go through the police log and we want to know from your perspective, some of the funnier police log entries. And we also want to know how St. Helena has changed from when you remember it, when you got here in the seventies, right? And then we also have the November 2000 or 1990. So the same week, but from 1990, the police log. So how it's kind of changed. So oh. the first episode, we did the old one first, and then the new one. I figure we can just kind of go back and forth. I like it. So to um, pick your favorite entry from the first week of November, okay. and we're going to talk about it. All right. Well, there's, there's so many. It's, it's, it's very, <laughs> very difficult to really choose what. But you know what? I guess it's, it's around this certain time of the year that, um, oh, my God. All right. This one I hadn't seen before. <laughs> A father said his 15-year-old son was drunk and had snuck out of the house through a, his bedroom window. Police found him hiding in the neighbor's yard and took him home. <laughs> what a homecoming, I'll bet that was. <laughs> Hi, Dad. <laughs> oh, boy. Wait, All right. Tom, Tom, Tom. Hello. This is his wife in the back. <laughs> this is Beverly. Uh, what about the time that our granddaughter, my Leo, went into the police station and said she couldn't walk the rest of the way home because she got a trumpet and it was too heavy to carry? Did they give her a ride? Yes. Yes. Oh, the police are really good about <laughs> that, folks. In fact, there was one, I think I'm, I'm going to try to find it again. But well, uh, before that, I've got one for you, Tom. Right. So Tuesday, November 12th, 8.54 in the morning. <laughs> Report of a man in his 70s who goes running every day in the Crane Sulphur Springs area and flips off passing cars. <laughs> and I was thinking if that was a bike, it might be you. Because I hear an avid bicycle. <laughs> but it's not. No, it's not. Believe me. <laughs> I, I have learned on a bicycle, you do not flip somebody off. Because they can come right on back and remove you forever. And not 8.54 in the morning, me on a bicycle? Uh, I don't think so. I'm still having my espresso. And, you know, <laughs> sorry, that's too early for me. So don't worry. I'm well, not I think gonna, I I'm found one that was you, Chris. Let's hear it. Someone no. saw a tall can of Coors Light open inside a parked car on oh. Hunt Avenue. <laughs> don't know anyone who lives on Hunt. No? No one at all. Coors Light? And Coors Light? Yeah, no, that wouldn't be me. <laughs> So, um, there was, oh, this is a good one. <laughs> Report of people picking olives on corner of Sylvaner Avenue and Riesling Way. And this is like domestic as it gets, but you want to pick olives, help yourself. I've got a backyard that goes forever, and there's olives all over the place. And if you've got the time and, and energy to pick those damn things... Because I used to bring them to the winery, and then we'd, I would make them. It takes lye and salt and, and plenty of washing and lots and lots and lots of water, so you better do it at a winery. It's more trouble than it's worth. I mean, you go to the store and buy a little container of olives. It's cheap <laughs> compared to all that work. Forget about it. So there was no reason to call these folks in. 
This is one of my favorites. So a caller using night vision goggles saw a hot spot on the ridge near Ida Clayton Road. The caller was transferred to Cal Fire. I don't know what you're using night vision goggles for, but more power to you if you think you've spotted a fire. No, he probably found some guy smoking a joint. You know, and so that's all it takes. I mean, night vision goggles will blow up on it. The just animal this. ones are always my favorite, too. Hill, I think, I think oh. you deserve to read this tall. Thursday, November oh. 7th. So Thursday, November 7th at 7 a.m. in the morning, 25, report of a crazy pigeon attacking people on Adams Street. Mm. <laughs> Can pigeons have rabies? No. You're the doctor. Well. Not the vet. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, and, they're the rats of the air. <laughs> an officer was flagged down by a movie director asking where to get pizza. Now, I know this wasn't Francis Ford Coppola. Because he knows where to go. And he makes his own, and he does a great job. And he lives all the way in Rutherford, so that's almost eight miles away uh, to get there. Uh, where so, would you get pizza, Tom, if you had to get it in Well, we had La Prima tonight, and it was really good. But we have a pizza oven in the back. But we have our own pizza mm-hmm. oven, and we quite often mm-hmm. will go to Trevina as well. They, nice. they are... Yeah, they're uh, rock stars. Pizza in St. Helena is like, you can't avoid it. Um, What about on Wednesday, November 6th, a hunter cam was stolen near Wapo Park Pump Station? We still are trying to decide where Wapo Park Pump Station is. Ooh, I know where that is. That's that's down there below the bridge. By Pope Street. Yeah. Okay. Off to that side. So, but why do they have a cam out there? And what is a hunter camp? Oh, wait, a hunter camp looking for a bear or a, yeah. a coyote or yeah. something so moving through. So do we through. think there's a bear moving through oh, Wapo Park? I don't know. But we <laughs> had one up in up in Howell Mountain, and we caught a bear, all right, on film, going into our Zinfandel vineyard and, and leaving behind a big tuft of hair and, and aroma. But uh, <laughs> th- these, there are some wild animals in the neighborhood, I'll say that much. But to steal the camera, that's pretty pretty low life, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> it's pretty rough. It was probably this guy on November 16th. Yeah. <laughs> Check that out. How about the report of a drunk man knocking on the front door of a Childs Avenue home? An officer found him and gave him a ride home. <laughs> what other cities would do that? Thank you, officer. So, <laughs> you know. This appears... a city? <laughs> this also happened in 1990 on the 1,000 block of Hunt Avenue... Subject reported buying beer for juveniles. Officer contacted oh. subject and gave him a ride home. No. <laughs> Not a good idea. There. I mean, that's kind of bleak. What, the juveniles or the guy buying, buying, the guy buying beer, beer for kids? I'm sorry, you know. How young were they? <laughs> Eight, nine, no. They like beer, Uncle oh. Curtin. Where, where were you guys in November of 1990? Angela was a baby, so we were mm-hmm. up in Yosemite. I was doing the Vintner holiday. Well, there we go. What about you? 1990? Yeah. yeah. How old were you? First grade. Ooh. Yeah. You know First damn well who you were. <laughs> I unfortunately had not graced the earth with my presence yet. Yeah. So talk to us about St. Helena in the, in the 90s then, Tom, or even the 80s. What was it what like? What was it like compared to, what was the crime like? Well... Everything was not black and white. Things were, we still, we had color back then, even though some pictures you'll see were not that way. But this was a, I would have to call it just beginning to be a tourist mecca. My first year in St. Helena was 1976, and we had gotten the bow from the world thanks to the Paris. Uh, tasting, the the judgment in Paris, 1976, and California in white wine and red wine beat the French. So all of a sudden, we were the mecca of wines of the world. Even though I came up here as a 16-year-old kid on a motorcycle, a motorcycle I acquired at 15 and a half in San Francisco, but when summer started, I started growing a goatee and ride up here, and I would take the tour at Martini or BV or Christian Brothers, it was called. Now it's the Greystone CIA, Culinary Institute of America, not uh, the other. But um, 
as long as I took the tour, I could do the tasting. As long as I did the tasting, I could buy some wine. So I'd buy some of these things for $1.90 or $2.20 that were pretty darn good. And this is when you were 15 and a half? 16 driving, years 16 old. That's old. right on a motorcycle. Anyone and give you a ride home from the San Leon Police no, Department? No, <laughs> I never got that far along. But, and you know, they really never carded. They really didn't care somebody on a motorcycle. And I picked up a bottle of 1963 Private Reserve for $3 a bottle. And the next year I went back for the 64 Private Reserve. They jacked up the price to three fifty a bottle. <laughs> yeah, jeez. But uh, I, I got a very good reception up here. And honestly, it was not a big tourist mecca until pretty much early in my career when I, like I said, that 1976 made all the difference in the world. And it was so convenient for people in San Francisco to come up here. But my first vintage was 1976. But I'm the original winemaker at Duckhorn, 1978 until 1999. I left in uh, just after the auction in June of 2000. I, I wanted to make sure that it didn't get announced before the auction. I feel there's a story there. What's that? I feel there's a story there. Well, I had mentioned it to a few people, and they, Mike Thompson, our congressman, he said, Tom, you can't leave Doc Horn. You are Doc Horn. That was kind of cool. <laughs> and then I got a call from Mr. Big the next day asking me if that was drunk talk that I was leaving. And I said, you know, I'd been hinting this for a long time. I was no longer really steering the ship or flying the plane. I was on autopilot. I was going to a lot of meetings. I had five winemakers working beneath me and they were all qualified to, to pretty much take over. There was no need for me at going to these meetings and doing that stuff. I wanted to get my feet wet, my hands dirty and get back to business. And so I, I, I went to this new company, no name yet, for, uh, was a Shalom Wine Group, but I wanted to do the Hewitt for sure. I got so enticed by that, and they gave me my way. And then this other fruit that was coming from primarily Beckstoffer Vineyards, uh, biggest grower in the Napa Valley, to make Merlot Cabernet. And so off we go with the, the 2000 vintage, and I inherited... 1999, I always like to say that I got something like 20,000 cases of wine and miraculously converted it into 2,000 cases <laughs> of wine, and the rest went to other players. I wanted to make sure that anything with my name or my reputation on it had a sterling reputation, and we, we stuck with that. We, we only made wines that we we're very proud of. Otherwise, we farmed them off to our, to our counterparts. Hmm. So in making wine, favorite, I won't even say AVA, just favorite place in the, if you could take a 10 tons of grapes. From anywhere in the anywhere world. in the world, where would it be? Well, I'd, I'd go in Oakville. It's going to be expensive if I don't have to pay for There's it. There's no budget. No okay, budget. no budget. It's like my shopping. There's no budget. <laughs> Hillary's paying for it all. It's going to be Oakville, <laughs> and you're going to start heading up in the hills toward the east, and there's something just phenomenal about that. I mean, it's a vineyard you can fall out of, but it, it, it they're phenomenal, phenomenal wines up there. Uh, the grapes are, and the potential is out of control. So I've got a, uh, I got a pulling toward Oakville. I'm making a wine for a, a, a gentleman who's Mr. Big in the, propane world in, in our area and has a gorgeous vineyard on Oakville Crossroad. I'm very, very happy to be making those grapes, but we're on the valley floor. As you start moving up into the hills, you're into God's territory. East side and west side, that's where Harlan is. And, you know, these wines that basically, I, I like to say I have a hundred dollar palate and I usually get a discount. So these things are in the neighborhood of thousands and it, insane um, wines, but um, high, high quality. 
So that would be my, my spot on the earth. Although I'm, I'm becoming, becoming more and more in love with Appalachian St. Helena, uh, my local down the street, around my block, all around my house. Um, they're, they're honest wines. They're the most wineries representative with what they, they call AVA, American Viticultural Areas. And uh, the next one behind us uh, south would be Rutherford, and the next one north of us would be Calistoga. St. Helena in, captures much of Napa Valley, including the narrowest portion of the valley, which is at Lodi Lane, uh, right by Duckhorn Vineyards, where I, where I basically began my real serious winemaking career, um, from hillside to hillside, less than a mile. So that's a, that's a pretty narrow strip and a phenomenal potential. Grace Family Vineyards being one of them up in the hills and Vineyard 29. These are becoming fabled uh, names. Nice. So with wine drinking, we see a lot of people get intoxicated too. This is kind of an offshoot, which we see a lot in here. So like on December or November the 8th, Excuse me, November the 7th at 1649? No, that was not wine. Don't blame wine. (laughs) An impatient and angry man threw his beer at a bartender and then walked out the front door. Bartender was not injured. But I think this one could have been wine. Medical aid for an intoxicated man in Main Street restaurant almost passing out while trying to get up to go to the bathroom. I'll do it. Yeah, okay. Fine. This one was beer, that one was wine. Do you have any And we have thing? another one. How about a report of a drunk woman yelling and swearing in front of the caller's young daughter on Main Street? Um, I, I'm, I'm sorry that you really should have wine with a meal. And it helps a lot for, you know, toning things down, if you will. Um... And I like to carry a breathalyzer just to be sure. <laughs> uh, and I noticed if I'm not eating and I'm just having uh, sipping and sipping and sipping, most of the time when I'm tasting wine, it's in the morning. And I'm not there to get a buzz. I am swirling around my mouth and spitting it out. So that's, that's a crucial aspect for most winemakers. And if it's 4.30, 5 o'clock, 5.30, 6 o'clock, I'm not assessing wines any longer. I'm probably going to have a beer or, um, you know, just have dinner and and find one of the wines that that I want to have. So if you're going to have a beer in St. Helena, favorite spot to have a beer in St. Helena, go. Ooh, good. You can't say raise because it's not raise anymore. Yeah, I know. And that's where I first started, I guess. that was. Let me just say my first job that I got when I interviewed... Because I don't have a favorite. Uh, my favorite is home. <laughs> okay, if I'm going to have a beer, I want to have it at home. So there. Um, otherwise, it's Mad Fritz. I mean, it's pretty expensive. But I can afford it. And uh, it's good. They, there's, it's honest to God, real beer. But when I first interviewed at Freemark Abbey, I was one of the last two finalists to come back again. And the gentleman before me went in, and he's interviewing, and he came out after a long time. I'm sitting there quite and a he's while. Friend. He's a friend, a longtime friend, like a good still friend. friend. And so he comes out and he says, good luck, you'll need it. And so <laughs> I went in to interview, and they're asking questions. He's, he's asking, Jerry Looper, great guy, um, mentor. He was the interviewer, winemaker for Freemark, and... He's asked me all these questions about analysis and uh, you know, just kind of trying to trip me up. And I don't think I tripped. But he said, you know, it's 445 right now. What are you, you going to do for the rest of the day? And I said, well, I'm thinking of going downtown and getting a beer. <laughs> and he goes, can I join you? I said, <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. So we get together at now it's Anna's. It used to be Ray's, right? Ray's. Mm-hmm. I didn't know. At a pool house, and we're sitting down having a beer, and he goes, "What a great answer that was!" A lot of these guys will tell you, "Oh, I'm going to be putting together another analysis or another set of wines. I want to see if you know that the blend works well." 
you don't taste after four o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> That's beer time, you know. And we came up with a term, it takes a lot of good beer to make a great wine. <laughs> it's still alive and well. Did you ever have to call the police for crazy wine drinkers or beer drinkers? No, I've never had to call the police for crazy wine drinkers. But I knew one of the police officers very well. And I pulled him aside one time and I said, you know, I go to bocce on my bicycle. And sometimes we finish winning a game, we're going to have some champagne, and now we're going to have some more <laughs> celebration. And now I'm going to be on my bicycle heading home. What happens if you guys pull me over? He goes, well, you know, we're going to, we're going to probably arrest you. <laughs> we're going to probably take you down to the jailhouse and, you know, impound your bicycle. And then we'll probably wake you up in the morning and release you on your own recognizance and not press charges. And I go, well, okay, that works. <laughs> it never happens, but it sounded like a pretty good outcome. <laughs> if you don't scary. get killed. You know. <laughs> what about this one, Tom? What happened on 2147, 947 on Friday, the 22nd of November? That's pretty bad. I mean, if you're ever going to go crazy, don't throw your laptop around. I mean, that is something that's very valuable. And especially who they throw that. And yeah, okay, so report of a man threatening to hit a bouncer with a laptop on Main Street Bar. Police arrested a 24-year-old St. Helena man on suspicion of public intoxication. Okay, I'm gonna throw so, my... per, per no. usual, I have a lot of questions. Yeah. We all, who was the bouncer? What, I think we what, know. What bar I know was damn it? Well what where bar? It was. I was <laughs> we go ahead and say it was Anna's. It's Anna's. Why do you have your laptop at almost 10 o'clock at night? It's just getting some work you done. You know, at Anna's? Do you bring your laptop silly. to Anna's and get work done? A lot of times people are carrying them, and you know, if it's in your pouch, it's it's a concealed weapon. Oh. <laughs> you know, Tom's got a point. Okay, here's my favorite one. Uh, Saturday, November 23rd at 6.13 oh, in the morning. Yeah. Go. Well, this man had was sleeping on a mattress that was left outside a, a home on Pope Street. Officers contacted him. He'd gotten drunk the night before and fallen asleep on the mattress. I'm heading home now, he said. <laughs> no problem. You think, right. you think he was Have a nice ride home. Right Do we think it was, was the guy that... Was he looking for his laptop? Yeah. <laughs> Did he assault the oh, bouncer? Man. Do you think? Do you think? Do you think the uh, the police also offered to have him take his bath or something? <laughs> Did he get a ride? Oh man, I have so many questions. That's bad. <laughs> a customer on Main Street business placed a hundred and seventy-five bucks. It must have been cash on the counter. Another man behind him stole it. Uh oh. He described an older man. White, older white man with a white beard. Tom? Tom? <laughs> I, got you I was wondering where I got that $175. <laughs> At 1117 in the morning? No. <laughs> Saturday? No, never mind. I'd maybe, be on my bicycle by maybe then. Maybe this poor little white man couldn't afford his medication. <laughs> yeah, right. Especially uh, with your charge. This one's made for you. <laughs> Report of the gypsies once again hanging out in a parking lot near Adam Street. Oh. An officer told them to leave the property. Damn gypsies. Do you think they had festive wear like in The Hunchback of Notre Dame? I'm sure they did. There are people that show up at Safeway and different stores, and they're they're basically looking for money. There was another one of those. Oh, I saw log. it earlier. Yeah, the homeless or some people. Let's see. That, children, typically. And maybe a, a scrawny dog. <laughs> 1540 on November the 25th, a dead squirrel in a walkway on Edward Street. That's serious. Call oh, the cops. Get to the side. <laughs> They're Call probably... The police department. I'm going to read one here, Tom. I want to see if you know anything about it. Thursday, November the 28th. Ooh, that's Thanksgiving. A caller from Pratt Avenue said a neighbor goes on to the caller's property and cuts a hole in the hedge at the property line. The caller caught him on camera doing it five minutes ago. Call the police. 
I happen to know a lot about that. <laughs> <laughs> Happy Thanksgiving, neighbor. <laughs> Because my next door neighbors aren't there now, and I'll take their garbage out on the street. And I'll, you know, typically they're recycling, and a lot of times they're they're green bin for all of our green waste. Particularly did this on a Thanksgiving last year to go get the green bin because I had filled mine with all the pruning that I was doing. And they said, that's just fine and dandy. Anytime you want, go ahead, help yourself. And so it was an empty bin. And I was over there with my pruning shears on my side. And they have a little waterfall. And I told them in the past, I want to, you know, I'm always trying to peek at it, see, see it, it when it's running, because it makes so much noise. And um, so I have my pruning shears, and there's one little piece of the hedge that's sticking up. And I'm just going to get rid of that. It's just... <laughs> I mean, it's about as big as my hand. <laughs> now I got it, and I throw it in the green bin, roll it to my house, and I start pruning again. He comes screaming over, oh, no, 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 yelling like, you, like it's the end of the world, like I, I stole his BMW or something. <laughs> or, you know, I don't know. I can't imagine what else I could have done worse than that. But he's swearing. He said, next time I'm going to call the cops and all this stuff. Well, he knows I've got a pruning shears in my hand. He's not coming much closer than quite a ways away. And I'm just saying, oh, no, I don't know what you're talking about. And I just continue pruning. And... Um, it was their side of the... It was our yeah. neighbor's side of the So pen. maybe an hour later, I'm in the house. The family's starting to arrive. We're about ready to... You know, take the bird out of the oven and I'll knock, knock, knock on the door. And I'll, we'll open up the door and there's a St. Helena policeman. <laughs> Whoa. Get outside, close the door. And I said, hey, what's going on? And he goes, well, you know, apparently, you know, you were caught on camera cutting <laughs> his hedge. Like I went out there with a pair of, you know, whackers and I just went crazy with this thing. Or a, you know, this just went nuts and I go come on are you kidding me he goes well you know he, he made he filed a report so we have to follow up on it I go happy Thanksgiving officer you know this guy fortunately I wasn't smashed or wasn't even slightly <laughs> tipsy and I just try to walk him through it and he goes like eh, yeah you know I understand but geez just don't do it again okay I won't do it again <laughs> fuck <God's sake. laughs> That's the best story I've ever had. Small town, town, wouldn't you say? Oh, here's a good one from 1990. Main Street and Charter Oak Avenue. Officer observed an accident with no injuries involving a vehicle and the wine train. Oh, yeah. How many cars has the wine train hit? It's been a few. It's been a few. And sometimes what happens is they're kind of sort of stuck on the track. Now they roar that that mm -hmm. that siren it's like a freight train going through iowa at 70 miles or 90 miles an hour they go crazy with that horn. And they go a lot faster too they used to go like seven, oh they're going seven miles nothing an hour. yeah they're 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 going fast i go faster on my bicycle <laughs> than they do and typically that's 18 to 20 and that's way faster than the train goes so you've got to really have a problem before that train's going to hit you but they did have more than one accident. In fact, the old picture at Trevina, uh, now it's mm -hmm. the Charter Oak. Probably still there, but a serious accident uh, with the, the, the train, train came through. Have you Wasn't the wine the train? train back then. Back then it was just the train. Mm. And they used to bring glass and wine supplies up here. How and cool. you know that, oh, like, I do. Do you have a favorite crime that ever Luigi happened in St. Helena? Like a favorite crime that you ever remember happening around here? Oh, there, yeah, it'll hit me. Four days after we had a big meal for my pops going away at yeah. the French Laundry. <gasps> oh, I remember this. Just before oh. Christmas. We... When we left there, like four days later, they closed for renovation and so forth. Somebody came in and stole a boatload 
of very, very high-end wines. And that was a big, big deal. Mm -hmm. And it was about four months, I think. It was a period of time before they finally caught the guy oh, I didn't know in they North him. Carolina. Oh. He was trying to sell the wines I was going to say, did he sell it or drink it? Well, these no. wines, no. Yeah, wait a minute. Where'd they get this? I mean, what are we talking? We're talking some DRCs. Some oh, yeah. Wines. And old, old, old Screaming DRCs. Eagles. No, so, yeah, but this would have been... Big mm. bottles of, of just... Two, so four, they, they had to have known why. We did, we did some 50s and 60s yeah. of Bordeaux. Hmm. Uh, they were there. No doubt about and it. What would be your number one oh, no. Tiffany wine? There have been many. I, I'd many. have to say there's probably 10. Hmm. But the best one I can recall off, off the cuff of my sleeve is my wife's birth year. It's 1947. Good year. And we had a DRC, I've had it more than once, which is Domaine Romani Conti from France, 1947, Burgundy, which, which is to like die Burgundy. for. Wait, Burgundy. What? Wasn't it right in the prime of the prime. Mm. And it, it, it was oh, an auction wine from the... The Bone. The, the, uh, Ospice, bone. De Ospice de Bone. Uh, that the mayor of Bone at the time is our oh I forgot that one our go to guy to stay in San Roman outside of Bone and he has a, a guest house company. and they own uh, Demptos now which is recent and Francois and they've Frere. owned Francois Frere for eons and on and on it goes the best barrels on the on the on the planet. Should we finish it off with a classic St. Helena one? Go for it. The last day here, uh, well, for the last day in November. Good. Not me. S report of someone using a leaf blower in Meadowood Circle outside the per permitted hours, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. And I'll tell you one thing. <laughs> There's one thing that drives me crazy about the whole Napa Valley, the stupid leaf blower. <laughs> I, I was going to ask what a, side you were on. Them I use a rake and, you know, pick them up and put them in the green bin. The leaf blower is the dumbest invention on the planet. And some of these guys in our neighborhood, they fire those up and they, they're not even wearing earplugs. So, you know, they're going to go deaf someday soon. <laughs> But they're just blowing those things around and typically right onto our property. And it just how stupid does it get? It's it's year round. It's the dumbest thing on the planet. They ought to outlaw the damn leaf blower. I forgot your name ended in an I, which means you use a rake and you have pea gravel. See, <laughs> pea gravel? Right? No way. I want concrete or grass. No, this. Well, so Tom, thank you so much for sharing the, the 2013 Hewitt with us. Um, that was a great one. It was scrumptious. Sure. Phenomenal. And I, I now have some more descriptors to use. Um, but thankfully, we invite winemakers and don't have to make the words up ourselves. Like yummy. Like yummy. And <laughs> yummy scrumptious. works. Yeah. But, yeah. <sighs> but you're a, an Avodah legend. We appreciate you. Yes, All thank right. you so appreciate much for coming on. Much. And you're our first yeah. guest. You will forever be known as the first guest of 911. Good. And the last. <laughs> Potentially the last. <laughs> hey, can, can I just throw in one... Wine, oh, wine descriptor. Sure. Yeah. Your favorite People wine descriptor. rarely can use, but if you find a wine that has plenty acid, like it's mm -hmm. almost grapefruit or lemon lime, something going on, lots of acid, use the term zippy. Because oh. I've used it and people look at me like I'm making something up, but it's a cool term. <laughs> Because if I had to describe Tom, I might say you were zippy too. Zippy da do da, zippy da <laughs> day. Bye, oh, oh my, my, what a wonderful oh, day. Oh, hey. <laughs> Thank you for Sunshine. listening. We'll see you next week. Thanks, everybody. You enjoy your evening and be safe.